This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. You already know I got the burner, cuz. They are the most overlooked criminals in our country. All nasty. They always expect the next to do. They never expect the female to do nothing. And among the most dangerous. I wouldn't give a a shot. When I was high on crack, it was easier for me to shoot you. And don't care. And probably laugh. Tell me whoop your and let you know who I am and I wish you would. They're girls in gangs. When you say let's go, let's go. The girl was getting smart and I just took off on her. I hit her and I was damning her head on top of the car. I even give you a choice sometime. You want to get shot with 357 or you want me to shoot you with this 05? Their reasons for a life of crime may be different. When a woman commits a crime, there's a man behind it. The thing, you know, that girls and women do, they do it for love. But like their male counterparts, they crave respect and money. In this world, they're not easily attained. They do some cruel things to girls, and they like it. <laughs> some of them like it. But when it's time for a fade, nigga, that's the best way to show a how to get at. Here, no rules apply. I'm talking about women laying out in the street like men. I did not put us here to get killed like that. I don't believe in my heart that I could ever kill a wife's mother. But then again, I do. Compton, California, 1979. It was late afternoon when 16-year-old Sylvia Nunn heard shots being fired outside her home. I'm laying up in my bed, and I hear all these gunshots, and I took off running. Sylvia found her 18-year-old brother, Marcus, a member of the Bloods, laying in a nearby park. And there was a crowd around him. And I was saying, let me through, let me through. Marcus had been walking his girlfriend to the bus stop when he was shot by a car full of Crips. And he was just laying there bleeding. I was saying, Marcus, Marcus. And I got mad. I was hurt. I was bitter. And I was ready to shoot you. I was ready to kill you. It was this moment that would change Sylvia's life and lead her to become one of the most infamous female gangsters in Compton. My brother's fight is my fight. I am my brother's keeper. Girls in Gangs. Of the approximately 800,000 gangbangers in the United States, an estimated 70,000 are female. In Los Angeles alone, there are some 5,000. I've been a soldier since day one. You gon' get that bleed. If we gotta pick up something, knock your ass up. This is Compton. Their crimes range from robbery to kidnapping to murder. You already know I got the burner cast to a Females, it's like, they ain't no different. They got guns, they sell dope, you know. It's easier for a female to go and walk up to a like, woo, woo, this woo, pop, pop, pop. Cause they don't nobody ever gonna expect it was a Yeah. Female gangbangers like Donna Graham have been around for decades. Donna, known as Cheetah, is an OG, an original gangster. She joined the Crips in 1970. I have fought men and girls. I mean, if we fighting, we fighting. If they getting off and the girls are there, we're gonna jump in. Little is known about these women, who often fly under the radar. Programs are focused at boys and men, and people will always overlook the girls and the women. It's such an anomaly. People, you know, want to hold this place for how women, you know, should act. Susan Cruz is a former gang member herself. She moved to Los Angeles in 1996, where she joined a neighborhood gang. A lot of it had to do with feeling alienated, feeling like a stranger in a strange land, coming to this country from my native El Salvador, not knowing the language, the culture clash, not fitting in. Cruz eventually left the streets. She 
She now counsels gang members and does community outreach. She's one of the few gang experts focused on females. Most people that I have trained will tell me that they would rather work with boys only rather than with girls. The last thing you'd want, you know, is to be afraid of women. The ability to create that kind of fear is enticing and draws many young girls into gang life. Being in the gang is, is very affirming and they will prove themselves that they can be just as crazy as the males. To have, you know, people fear you can, you know, be very empowering. Okay, keep it real, don't, don't get me wrong. This carry burners, burners. Uh, good. There are other reasons that girls join gangs. Many come from broken homes and are looking for support. It's really rare, you know, to see that a girl will try to find, you know, something to replace her family if everything's okay in her family. Usually, something is really, really not okay for her to be trying to find something to replace it with. That was the case for this woman from Compton, who goes by her street name, Difficult. You gotta fight. You got, might have a, a girl that look at you in the wrong way, and then that might lead to a fight right there. You just had to defend yourself. Difficult was only six years old when her mother, Linda, went to jail. I was a fool. <laughs> I took the rap for my boyfriend. He said he would get 12 years if I didn't tell them that the drugs were mine. Linda spent two years in prison. Without a mother at home, Difficult found the family she was missing out on the streets. When she was 13 years old, she joined the Bloods. If you don't want to be part, part of their little gang or whatever, they're going to keep treating you like an outsider. So I wasn't really there for her. You know, well, she blames me a lot for that. There's something else that drives women into gangs. Love. Many girls get involved because of a relationship. You know, they're the girlfriend of, of a boy who's in the gang or the family member is in the gang. My girl in the front seat looking fine as wine, thin as wind. Relationships are so important to girls and women and the things that they will do for love short of, you know, giving up their lives. And some of them even do that, giving up their freedom. Whether they're sisters or girlfriends, the women are assets to the gang, especially when it comes to hiding contraband. Male police officers are less likely to search a woman. Fifty-year-old Reverend Ricky Pitts is a minister from Compton and a former member of the Bloods. The girl can walk away, usually come and get the guy, and the girl step back out the way. She got the gun all the time. He's clean, because she's carrying on, you know. She's you know, she doing all the dirty work. More women are doing the dirty work than ever before, thanks to California's three strikes policy. Under this law, offenders with three violent convictions are automatically sentenced to 25 years to life. The result is prisons that are overcrowded with men and women committing crimes on the street. Too many of the black brothers is going to the pen. Too many of the women is, is, is getting them double digits. The judge ain't playing with you no more. Girls today is the ones that's putting in the work. Putting in work can mean anything, even murder. That's what's putting in work mean, to take life in your own hands. Handle your business and don't get caught slipping. But the main thing is going to, to kill. In some type of way, form, fashion, or matter, is to kill. To take life in your own hands. In your own hands. And for female gangbangers, loyalty is more important than staying out of prison. The gang becomes your family. When you hurt somebody in, in your family, then you, the other person has to pay for it. That mentality is what pulled Sylvia Nunn into the Bloods nearly 30 years ago. 
Her exploits earned her the street name Rambo. I would dress up like a dude. You no know, makeup and fingernails and jewelry. All that would come off. Black shoes, black socks, black pants, black shirt, black coat, and a beanie. A red flag up under the beanie. And just put my work in. Boom, 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 boom. And back to my car, jump in and throw it in neutral, take that off. Next day, you know I'm a girl, and I'm sexy, and I'm driving. Sylvia dressed up like a man the day her brother Marcus was shot by the Crips. I went home, because I knew where my dad hid his guns at, because I was planning on killing me a lot of Crips that day. What 16-year-old Sylvia did next sealed her transformation from girl to gangster. Shooting a gun. Shooting somebody. That first time. After that, it ain't hard to do. If you can get over it the first time, it's not nothing that you can't do again. The original battleground for LA's violent street gangs. We coming. For real, you better keep your kids in the house, homie, because it's going to town. Homie. Yeah, that's going through the walls. That's that's real. Compton sits just 22 miles southeast of the ritzy streets of Beverly Hills. Yet the homicide rate is six times higher than the national average. For gangbangers here, like this crip, young guess, death is no stranger. I'm like kind of a, a professional mourner now, you know. Death don't really bother me like that. It hurt real bad when you love somebody and they die, but I don't give a about it no more. Linda has lived in Compton for three decades and raised children here. She survives by staying inside. I don't go out at night. The boogeyman is out at night. You know, you tell the kids that fairy tale, but it's really true. Even going to school is a risky proposition. Linda's second oldest daughter, who goes by her street name, Difficult, often packed weapons as a child. Growing up where I be at, you gotta fight. You can't stay out of it. Whether you carry a knife, carry a mace, a bat, a pen, you could turn anything into a weapon. Your hands can be a deadly weapon. She always wanted a gun, but I would never give her a gun. But I did give her a mace. I gave her a stun gun. You know, just to protect herself so she can make it home. I'd rather visit her in jail than have to go to a gravesite. Difficult wasn't the only girl packing weapons. You already know I got the burner test. There are approximately 200 female gangbangers in Compton. Many of them hang out here in Looters Park. Every day or a day, or you can catch me in the pork doing my thing, pork story, giving it up, and turning it out no fags except in oil in this, huh? We take it, we take it, we take it, we give them back. Looters Park is a six acre playground in the middle of Compton. Here, female gang members are used to police. Take a look, it's like six cars out here right now, ain't even doing nothing. You see, they got a surround hood, my n, so, because we ain't got nowhere to go. They black. Looters Park is familiar territory for local police. Each day, police conduct raids and round up gang members. Hey, baby. <laughs> a lot of gang members do hang out here and have hung out here. They have a lot of meetings here, and yeah, several people have been shot and killed here. The park serves as headquarters for the Pyrus, the largest and first blood set. Named after a street near the park, it is the same neighborhood where Sylvia Nunn, an original gangster in the Bloods, grew up. To me, this is the grounds of the devil. You have bombs, you have smokers, you might have syringes in the sandbox, you might have razors in the sandbox, you might have crack pipes in the sandbox. If you dig deep, you might find a gun here or there. This park is a headstone to me. I have had so many loved ones die right here in this park, take their last breath. I have had so many homeboys and homegirls lay here in this park and the ambulance pick them up. And if hell is anything like this, 
I sure don't want to go. Sylvia and her family first moved to Compton, then a largely white city in the late 50s. Like many other middle-class black families, the nuns were drawn by the city's single-family homes. My mother and father worked hard to make sure that we had everything. We were a high-class, upper black family. I had a new car every year. In the 1960s, racial tensions began growing as the civil rights movement gained momentum across the country. Then, on August 11th, 1965, Compton's relative peace was shattered. In the neighboring city of Watts, a white police officer beat a black man, Marquette Fry. Riots broke out, and for six days, looting and fighting ruled South LA. Donna Graham, an original gangster known as Cheetah, was 12 years old when her family got caught in the turmoil. The police did run over my brother on 111th and Avalon, and they just left him there. They didn't go back to help him or nothing, just hit him and left him on the side of the tracks. Cheetah's brother survived, but in just six days, 34 people were killed. More than 1,000 were injured. In the aftermath, Whites fled Watts and Compton, but the unrest remained. City officials began enforcing unpopular laws that mandated the racial integration of schools. Children found themselves in new neighborhoods and began closing their ranks. Memories of the Watts riots were still fresh, and distrust of the LAPD ran high. In 1969, the first black gang in South Los Angeles, the Crips, was born. We just protected our neighborhood and didn't allow no other persons coming over there, destroying our neighborhood or messing with our older people. If we went somewhere and somebody fought, we all fought. Compton answered with its own gang, the Bloods. Sylvia's older brother, Marcus, whose street name was China Dog, was a member. My brother's a big deal. He's the dog. He's the ball, wow, wow, yippee, yo, yippee, yay. He the dog. They don't f the dog. Sylvia's father, Willie, a former professional boxer, taught her how to fight and shoot a gun. My dad told me, I'm going to teach you everything that a woman needs to know. You ain't going to need a man but for one thing, and that's the bedroom. When I get finished with you, you're going to be able to change your own flats, steal your own car shoot your own gun, and fight your own fight. Cause you my baby, and I don't want nobody effing with you. In 1973, Sylvia's father was convicted of drug possession and sent to prison. With her father in jail, life in the nun home began to unravel. By the mid 70s, fighting between the Bloods and the Crips intensified, and gang membership exploded. From the beginning, women were in the mix. They were dubbed the Criplets and the Bloodettes. 18-year-old Cheetah, who lived in a Crips neighborhood, was pulled in reluctantly. I didn't want to be a Criplet. And when I was asked, or I, I really wasn't asked, I was told. At first, the female gangbangers were mainly support for the guys. They helped protect their neighborhoods from rivals by fighting though rarely with guns. It was like fighting, you know. Somebody would come over there and say, we'll meet you at the park and they'll meet up and they would fight. But we wasn't shooting each other and stuff. There was one girl who did carry a gun, Sylvia Nunn. She was the youngest girl that really hung out at the park. Be a nine to 10 years old, she had a pistol always packed on her. Sylvia wanted to prove she was as tough as her older brother Marcus. So she jumped when his homies asked her to help rob a gas station. We walked over there, and they carried me on their shoulders. And then when they get up there, they walk up. She's in a booth. And they like, we finna rob this You better not push no buttons. And then they took like the handle of their gun, bust the window out enough, and put me through it. 
Sylvia took all the money from the register and gave it to the Bloods. Then she demanded her share. Mom was like, that y'all gonna give me some money too. And they was like, damn, this is a crazy little girl. Like, yeah, right? We'll buy you a popsicle or some candy. I say, no, the you want, you gonna give me some money. And they gave me some change. They gave me a whole bunch of change. By the late 70s, the percentage of female gangbangers was on the rise. The women earned their stripes by taking orders. The men would never be afraid of women, you know. They just know a woman to do what a man tell them to do. But one young woman continued to stand out from the pack, Sylvia. All the girls really, they were fearful of her. But as time got older, she got more ruthless. With both Sylvia and Marcus in the bloods, the Nunn family was central in the gang. Without their father there to stop it, their home became its unofficial headquarters. Everything in the house was red. Red carpet, red furniture, we had red walls. I mean, it was just like blood down. It was also a constant target for the Crips. We sitting in the living room, you talking. We hear one shot hit the floor. We were so used to hitting the floor till it just became a routine. The house was just like, shot up like shredded cheese a lot. It really was. I mean, day and night, day and night. Sylvia was afraid of no one, including the police. She earned her nickname one day when an officer questioned her mother about Marcus. The police is telling my mother, I know you know with your son that you might as well tell us because we're going to kill him when we see him. And I took off on our police. Bam, you don't talk to my mother like that. And one of the police said, who the like you is Rambo or somebody? And I turned around, kicked him, hit that one. I'm just, just doing what my dad taught me to do. By 1980, Rambo was the top dog among hundreds of female gangbangers. I was what you would call a gangster. A gangster, I acted like a boy. I sagged my pants, I wore boxers. I would do the do-rag thing. I was gangster. Fight at the snap of the finger. You said, what? I didn't already hit you in the mouth. The rules changed, however, in the 1980s. A brand new drug appeared on the streets, and gang life would never be the same. Crack cocaine came to South Central, and the women went to the dogs. The men went to the dogs. Everybody was on crack cocaine. in California, the 1980s. What was once a middle-class city was now flooded with crack cocaine. Like their male counterparts, female gangbangers wanted a piece of the action. For single mothers like Linda, the opportunity to sell drugs was too lucrative to pass up. I have three kids, so that's what I did. I sold drugs to make the extra money. I kept the income coming in and I kept a roof over their head. It was enough food to eat. Single mothers weren't the only ones selling or using the drug. Crack had spread like wildfire throughout the community. You couldn't believe doctors, lawyers was on cocaine. It was crazy. One evening, Cheetah was in the hospital in Compton when she realized her nurse was smoking crack. When I woke up one day, my nurse had a pipe in my drawer on the side of my bed. And I told my doctor, if I didn't kill myself, they was gonna kill me because my nurse was on drugs. And I checked, he let me go home. Gangs were the engine that drove the crack epidemic. Not only were they the chief suppliers, but many gangsters were getting hooked, including blood member Sylvia Nunn, AKA Rambo. I wouldn't give a who I shot. If I, if when I was high on crack, it was easier for me to shoot you and don't care and probably laugh, be laughing. That's what it was like on crack. Life on the streets grew even harder for women and gangs. 
Violent crimes were more common, and families fell apart as users and dealers were killed or sent to prison. The drug epidemic would also change the role of women in gangs. Before crack, girls joined up because of relationships. Their boyfriends or brothers were members. Now, women were joining gangs in record numbers, making up to one-third of some cliques. Their motivation? Fast money and easy access to drugs. To get drugs, some women bartered their bodies. Sex became a means to an end. Cracks changed the role of women in the gang because once you become real addicted to it and you get to do anything for it, how can a homeboy respect you? It's hard to see you as that, that homegirl again that they looked up to. In the past, females used their association with male members to join the gang. But as the stakes became more dangerous, so did their initiations. Girls had to fight their way in. They ask you a couple questions or whatever, test you or whatever. And if you pass the test, I mean, you can get put on, it's nothing. But the thing is, you gotta get down. Look at us like, okay, these just females. But yeah, do you know we'd be saying, bitch, we're gonna go too. You feel me, my? Sometimes, you know, you have to fight about five, six, seven, eight people. It depends. You might have to shoot somebody or drive by, whatever the hell they might do. It's your choice to make. There's another way girls join by getting sexed in. There's certain people that believe you can get put on a whole nother way. <laughs> that is another put on. You can get put on like that if you want to. Some of them do get sexed in. Some of them have to, you know, probably have to do it to about five different guys or three different guys. In the eyes of both male and female gangbangers, girls who are sexed in are less respected. Most of the, the, the females that do get sexually um, initiated in, they be already, you know, hoes, sluts, tramps, and stuff like that. They just, they just ain't getting paid for it. Those girls and women are not officially recognized by most gangs as being part of the gang. Eventually, you know, they start also being alienated and shunned and cast aside. And so what they had thought was gonna be the easy way in was actually also the, the hard way out. Girls who are sexed in may not last for long, but those who put in their work do. Sit the, up, yeah! the more crime a girl commits, the more important her role in the gang becomes. You throwing up down here? Hell yeah. Nowadays, how this world is, you got someone that want to be guys that, that look like men and stuff like that. So, you know, that want to be guys that's harder than these guys out here, you know, that put more work in than these guys out here, you know? There is one boundary many girl gangsters don't cross when they're doing their work. Unlike the men, most only attack for personal reasons. When girls assault, it's usually something that's very personal to them. It's not just some random, you know, nondescript stranger. Uh, someone, you know, that hurt them. Violence isn't the only way female gangbangers do their work. Some also use their sexuality as a weapon to spy on rival gangs. Girls and women are utilized by a gang, you know, to get back or to lure or to entrap rival gang members. Nothing is fair in love and war. Some girls pretending like guys just to get what they got, you know? You know, or to set them up for what they got or whatever. It's a dangerous game with serious consequences. Male gang members, like young guests, don't like to be fooled. When I deal with women, I let them know. Don't put me in a twist. Because I'll break your neck just like I break your neck. In spite of their tough ways, the girls still aren't welcomed by all gang members. It really does depend on the gang gangs are that that slice of society men and gangs view their women just like regular men do they want to make sure that they're kept in a place that's checked okay that they are not above them or that they don't hold more than them i ain't with all that old females banging because they they females that, that ain't they place to gang bang women in gangs are bound by the same rules as the men 
I'm from West Side of Cajun Block, come from Crip, all nasty cuz. Most can't leave without risking payback, unless they're pregnant. Once they become mothers, you know, then they can leave the gang. It's, it's very highly acceptable. And it's actually almost a requirement, you know, for some gangs that they, you know, change their status because nobody wants, you know, a, a pregnant, you know, woman dead. Leaving a gang is never easy, though, especially for longtime gangbangers like Sylvia Nunn. For her, the lines between gang and family disappeared in 1979, the day her brother Marcus was shot by the Crips. If you shot my brother, I could kill your mother. If you shot my sister, I could kill your mom and your dad. If you shot my nephew or my niece, I could kill your whole family. Nineteen seventy nine, Compton, California. Sylvia Nunn was just sixteen years old when her brother Marcus, a member of the Bloods, was shot by a car full of Crips. Marcus survived the shooting, but bent on revenge, Sylvia grabbed her father's gun and headed out with her brother's homeboys. And they threw me a jumpsuit like a gas station attendant. <laughs> threw on a ski mask and threw a blue rag around my neck. And we got in the Impala and we went to that set. Sylvia and the Bloods drove into Crip territory looking for the shooters. We parked the car and put it in neutral. And we strolling down the street. And the homeboys are saying, what's up, cuz? And everybody else is saying, what's up, cuz? And we just strolling by it. And some just went through all through my body. And I snatched that damn beanie off and just let out, just started shooting. Sylvia and her homeboys shot into a crowd of crips. Sylvia was hooked. Shooting a gun is like eating an apple to me. Then you eat the apple. And it tastes good. Then after a while, every day you eat on an apple. Over the next decade, Sylvia would work hard at earning her nickname, Rambo. We weren't cowards. We didn't do drive-bys. Trust me, I throw my in neutral and get out and just bust on your I even give you a choice sometime. You want to get shot with a 357 or you want me to shoot you with this 45? Nunn wasn't the only woman calling the shots in Compton. By the end of the 1980s, Donna Graham, known as Cheetah, was also a high ranking member of the Crips. Like the male members of her gang, Cheetah was more than willing to put in work. If another gang came in our hood doing drive bys, of course, you're gonna go do the same. You mess with me, then I'm coming at you. And you'll know, because it'd be out there. Even motherhood didn't stop Cheetah from gangbanging. And one night in 1980, someone came looking for her in retaliation. I had just had a little boy, and he was a baby. All you hear is all these gunshots. And I'm jumping, trying to grab my baby out the baby bed and get on the floor. And all you hear is these gunshots and they hollering, somebody hit, and it was just crazy. Cheetah and her baby escaped unharmed. By the end of the decade, a large percentage of Compton's 2,000 gang members were female. Many would pay a heavy price for their membership. July 23rd, 1991. It was mid-afternoon when Sylvia Nunn received a phone call. I said, hello, and my mother said, Sylvia. And just the way she called my name, I automatically knew somebody was dead. And I said, oh, mama, please don't tell me nobody killed Marcus. She said, no. And I said, oh, don't tell me my daddy dead. I'm already crying. She said, no, Junior dead. And I didn't believe her. 
Sylvia's oldest brother, Junior, was walking down a side street in Compton when a strange car drove by. He was shot in the back of the head and died on impact. Unlike Sylvia and Marcus, Junior had never been part of the gang. He was so damn humble. If you say, Junior, here, kill that fly for me. Uh, did, 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 uh, he stuttered. Did it then? Uh, you kill it. He did, did, the fly got a right to live like you got a right to live. Junior was part of the royal family of the blood's largest set, the Pyrus. For a rival gang member, taking out a nun was the ultimate hit. I think they might have killed Junior. Probably, maybe for something I had done. People forgive. They don't forget. You could kill a nun, and where you would kill an average pyro, you just steal a crib. But to kill a nun is to be a soldier. Sylvia returned home that afternoon with one mission. Rode around through the neighborhood asking questions, trying to find out what we could find out. And the names that did pop up, each and every one of them are dead today. Ask me, am I sad about it? No, not one single bit. Death knocked on all their doors, and their mother got to experience what my mother got to experience. After the murder of Junior, Sylvia's life spiraled downward into addiction. A friend of mine started rocking it up. You could take one of his rocks and smoke it all day. That's just got how good his dope was. So it came from the point of being a rich kid to being a crackhead. Sylvia became a hardcore dealer and would do anything necessary to keep police from discovering her stash. I just remember this one time I had my nephew and the police was coming and I had this dope. <laughs> so I put him on his diaper and I put the dope in the, in laid the dope on him and then I put another diaper on him and went on down the street. In April of 1991, as Sylvia walked home from a store, she was approached by police. They had a warrant for her arrest. He said, now check this out. Either you finna go to jail for that warrant, or you finna train my police for me. Training the police meant one thing. She would have to reveal the inner workings of her gang. Sylvia decided to cooperate. She told police about how she and her gang moved drugs around Compton. I used to walk around with a bear or a doll, a stuffed animal, and I would melt rocks on my doll's eyes and stick pipes in the doll mouth. Within months of cooperating with authorities, Sylvia decided she was no longer safe on the streets of Compton. She needed to get out of town, but didn't have the money. Until one night, a man picked her up on the street. He said, okay, how much you charge? Well, I'm not a prostitute, so I don't really, you know, I can't tell you how much I charge. I say 500. He says that for all night? I said, yeah, I'll just say yeah. So he took $500 out and gave me five $100 bills. Sylvia took the money and ran. She bought a bus ticket to Las Vegas. The bus came, I took the bus to Nevada with the clothes on my back. Compton, California. The gang violence that has torn the city apart for decades continues with no signs of stopping. Yeah. What it do? Eastside cop, this boat sound crap. I don't think cops are cursed, I, I think the people are cursed. You know, the innocent children, daddy would leave behind a foolishness. Grandparents could be in their house just sitting there, knitting, crocheting, and bullets come flat the wall and killing them. You know what I mean, for no reason. I say it's senseless. Some gangsters do make it out. Cheetah, an OG with the Crips, almost died in 1994 while fighting another female gangster. The girl was getting smart and I just took off on her. I hit her and we were fighting and I was bamming her head on top of the car and she was stabbing me. So she stabbed me here. I never felt it. And she hit me in my back and tore my lungs. 
it was so much blood gushing out my back. I just knew I wasn't gonna make it. The incident left Cheetah scared. She decided it was time to get out of the game. That's what made me change, because it happened to me. Cheetah now works with Ceasefire, an organization that tries to halt gang violence. She says it's like stopping a runaway train. There's a lot of women dying like that. A lot of men's women killing men faster than ever now. You no, know, and it gotta stop. It gotta stop somewhere. More women are in gangs now than ever before. Currently, there are over 200 female gang members in Compton. It's a trend that frightens gang expert Susan Cruz. History will repeat itself unless, you know, there is a way to break that cycle. There have been plenty of studies showing that if a parent, and usually say a mother, is incarcerated, chances are one of her children will be. It will sort of play out itself in our future generations. And the same, you know, holds true with gangs. Today, difficult is holding down a job and working hard to stay out of trouble. Yeah, I have changed. I try to avoid a lot of fights and altercations from happening and starting. I learned how to control my temper a lot more better than what I normally would do. Normally, I would snap. Yet her past is always knocking on the door. I'm like, see my enemies all day, every day. I get y'all past. You wanna know why I get your past? Because you done this up past, and you right here walking with your baby, not knowing I could murk you in your baby if I wanted to. Difficult's mother, Linda, says raising the rest of her family in Compton and keeping them out of gangs are daily struggles. Around here, that's... You gotta watch your back. It's just the way of life. My kids watch their back. I know some people that have gotten out of it. They usually they have to move away. It ain't all about what you do sometimes, it's how you do it. For Sylvia Nunn, the blood's most notorious female gangster, the only way to escape the past was to leave Compton. Sylvia moved to Las Vegas in 1993 after decades of violent gangbanging. Shortly after she arrived, Sylvia met a man and fell in love. Opposites attract. He used to be high sheriff of Kansas City, Missouri. Been doing construction all his life. But there was just one problem. He wasn't having it. It was like, you choose the gang and the dope, or you choose me. Sylvia stopped using drugs and gangbanging. She married the former sheriff and construction worker. 15 years later, they're still together. Sylvia also began attending church. I put on a suit and I went to church and I joined church. And I've been in church since then. In the name of Jesus. And I um, put down Pyro and I picked up Jesus. Get out the gang! Leave the gang members alone. Let them go about their business. The bullets ain't got no names. And when you gang bang, you're putting your whole family in jeopardy. Now, I believe that somebody should hear her story because today somebody's out there who's going through what she went through. If I just can touch one, then all that stuff I done did in the past won't be in vain. And God will be in forgiving me. Yes! I would describe myself today as a saved, sanctified, filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost woman. How many know what we're saying about? recovering drug addict and an ex-gang member who's happily married and love God.